Roundup is affecting the taco industry. Details at 7, only on We Cook TV News. All food news, all the time. We're back with the news with We Cook TV. I'm Jason here to talk to you about uh, strokes and stroke prevention. Uh, so, a stroke uh, is most often caused by a lack of blood flow inside of the brain and big risk factors for that would be high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, diabetes. Those are the biggest, you know, the biggest causes of having a stroke. Now a stroke, some people can get, you can get lucky and have what's called a mini stroke, meaning that you have stroke-like symptoms which completely resolve within 24 hours. Uh, stroke-like symptoms, you know, stroke symptoms can be numbness in your face or in, a, in an extremity, like your hands and feet. Uh, it can be weakness, it can be difficulty speaking, uh, difficulty swallowing, problems with cognition. There's just a vast array of symptoms, uh, which it really depends on, you know, which blood vessel or blood vessels are affected. Now, if you are to have stroke-like symptoms, you would want to get to your nearest emergency department as soon as possible, because there are interventions that can be uh, that can be undergone, um, and time is time is of the essence. You know, every second counts to preserve or restore um, blood flow to the brain cells. So, you, you know, there's medications that can give, be given to kind of bust up those clots if you are. You know, if you're a good candidate, if you meet certain criteria, uh, and occasionally someone will have a, you know, a spot, a clot in the brain uh, at a spot that can be reached by an interventional neurologist or an interventional radiologist where, kind of like when someone has a heart attack um, and you get a heart cath, you know, and the cardiologist goes up and blocks, uh, I'm sorry, opens up the blockage, very similar things can be done when you have a blockage in the brain. Uh, it can go up and kind of get that clot out of there and restore blood flow and sometimes sometimes people uh, don't have any relief in their symptoms but a lot of times they get significant relief and sometimes even go completely back to normal. When I was talking about mini strokes, those, uh, those are, like I said, stroke-like symptoms that completely resolve in 24 hours. But you should never blow those off because if you have a mini stroke, a lot of times that's a warning sign that you can have a big stroke coming. It could be the next day, it could be a few months, it's hard to say, but you would want to you know, go to the hospital or see your physician as soon as possible uh, so that you can have tests performed to lower your risk of having a future stroke. And the way to lower those risks would be, you know, a good diet, which we could talk about, uh, exercise, weight loss, smoking cessation. Uh, if you're diabetic, you want to keep your blood your blood sugar under control. Uh, you want to keep your blood pressure under control. If you have high blood pressure, you want to see a physician about getting on medications to lower your blood pressure. And the same thing with high cholesterol. Um, so you know you would want to eat a diet that's uh, more plant-based. Uh, I'm not saying you need to cut out all red meats. There's various uh, various schools of thought on on all that, but you would definitely want to limit your red meat in, red meat intake to you know maybe a couple of times a week. Uh, try to get more you know, chicken and fish and uh, leafy green vegetables, fruit. Increase your water intake. And most of us don't drink nearly as much water as we should. Uh, you know, a general rule of thumb, you know, for most otherwise healthy healthy people, you should drink a half an ounce of water for every pound that you weigh throughout the course of the day. Now, if you're out in the heat, if you're exercising a lot, then you're gonna obviously need, need more. If you have history of, you know, like, kidney disease where you're on dialysis or if you have congestive heart failure where you need to be restricted on fluid then you're, you're going to probably want uh, less water intake but that's something that you should see your you know, 
your primary care physician or your specialist such as your nephrologist which is your kidney doctor or your cardiologist your heart doctor you know you'd want to kind of get a general uh, a general outline of how much fluid you can you can actually take and ways to lower your blood pressure in addition to taking medications would be uh, you know, decreasing your salt intake like it, like I said decreasing your, your red meat intake um, things like that as far as you know if you're diabetic you want to you want to make sure that you get your blood blood sugar under control. Insulin, if you need that, if that's what your doctor recommends. Sometimes you can just take pills, and sometimes you can, you know, you can lower your blood sugar just through a good diet, uh, low in sugar, you know, high in fruits and vegetables, um, and uh, and exercise and weight loss. Improve the function of your pancreas and and improve uh, your chances of living a long healthy life. Uh, if someone were to have a stroke, like I said, you'd want to get to a hospital as soon as possible. Uh, so we, you know, we could do various tests including a CAT scan, you know, determine if you are a candidate for a clot busting type of drug or any sort of intervention. Now, sometimes people have had, you know, the time has gone too long or they're not a good candidate for, you know, whatever reason, be that, you know, they're They've recently had a head bleed, you know, from various trauma, or if their blood pressure's you know, too high, or if their stroke is just so massive that giving them a clot busting type of drug would put them at, at increased risk of having a worse outcome. You know, you can have a very debilitating stroke. Strokes can can kill someone. Um, but if you've had a stroke, you know, in addition to numbness and weakness and slurred speech or problems with cognition you know people stroke patients can have uh, can have difficulty swallowing so they would have to um, be on a certain diet you know after they're seen by a dietitian and a speech therapist to help determine you know what kind of foods can this person actually tolerate if you fail a, a swallow study which is performed by a speech therapist um, you may not be able to eat anything by mouth at all, or they may put you on uh, a pureed diet, which means you know everything needs to be like a slurry kind of consistency. And obviously, this would you'd get more education through a speech therapist and a dietitian, but you know some of those things would be you know you would uh, you know you would want to pick foods that puree easily um, you know most fruits vegetables uh, milk honey those type of things you want to avoid foods that are stringy like celery cheese anything that has nuts or seeds like has a tough skin but you want it to be like a very smooth pudding like consistency which you know all in all um, Kind of onerous to be able to have someone you know, make your meals puree it up like that. You know they have to make sure they're doing all the right things, having all the right uh, foods, that, so they can put in a food processor or a blender and get it in the right consistency, so that you're able to still get nutrition, uh, but not not choke on. I'm sorry, not aspirate your. Uh, your uh, your meal, meaning you know the food going down uh, your airway, and which can cause pneumonia, and you know, pneumonia can lead to uh, to fevers, it can it can lead to needing to be admitted to the hospital, and it, people actually people actually die from what's called aspiration pneumonia. So all in all, it's better to be proactive and decrease your risks of having you know, diabetes, high blood pressure, a stroke, things like that because uh, once you get to the point where you're not able to tolerate food, only having a pureed diet, you know, your, your quality of life is not as good as it would be if you were able to 
you know, turn back the clock and be proactive and, uh, and uh, you know, at a, be at a good weight, be active, and uh, it's much, much, much better to prevent a stroke than it is to have one and then try to rehab from there. You know, some, some people regain a decent amount of function after a stroke, but you know, a lot of times they don't. And you know, once you're paralyzed on one side or you can't eat, eat well, then you know, your quality of life will decrease. And a lot of times it puts you at risk of other of other strokes, of other infections. You know, if someone is paralyzed on one side and, and needs to, you know, isn't able to get out of bed, you know, they're at risk of bed sores, urinary tract infections, things like that. So it's much better to uh, to prevent, you know, pre prevent strokes up front than it is to try to have a good quality of life afterwards. So with that, uh, back to you with Australian cheese. Hi, I'm here with Chris today. We're talking about Australian cheeses. So Chris, tell us a little bit about what you have going on in your different varieties and what makes your cheese so special. Sure, thank you. Well, I guess um, what I try and do with my cheeses is express um, some of the native ingredients that we have in Australia. So for me, it's about telling the Australian cheese story through cheese. I've got a whole bunch of different ingredients here, things like calistamine flowers, which is like a bottle brush flower that grows wild in Australia. Yeah, and that's this one here? That's that one there, it's called Flinders. Yeah, we've got this one here, which is Monet. The flowers are all organically grown for us in, uh, in Australia. And these are all edible flowers? They're all edible flowers. Okay. This is quite a super special one, okay? This has got green ants on it. Green, green ants that are indigenous to Australia. Oh, wow. So you can see the little ants there. They've got a little sack on the back of the abdomen, which is really quite spritzy, and it's a combination of kaffir lime and lemongrass. Um, they are from the far top of Queens, uh, Queensland and also the Northern Territory. They're really amazing. Now, this cheese actually won a super gold medal at the World Cheese Awards in 2016. Yeah, it came number 11 out of 3,000 cheeses. So over here we've got another cheese which is called Picasso. Uh, this is actually covered with South Australian salt bush and then we decorate it with native petals. So I, I tend to have a lot of different native ingredients, but as I said, for us it's about telling the story of Australia through cheese and, and you know using our native ingredients means that they're in abundance and that you know they're a story that I can tell um, from my country and my terroir which I think is really important okay um, and so we've got cow um, cow milk cheeses we've got goat and we've got buffalo so there's a whole array of different cheeses and different flavor profiles. All right so you said you have some buffalo cheese tell me about that. What okay. have we got going on over there? Yeah. So there's only one buffalo herd in South Australia. Um, we take most of their milk. This particular cheese here is a buffalo Persian feta. It is super, super creamy, okay? So, so creamy. We've got a, a lovely little bit of olive oil going on in there, and um, it is just the most amazing cheese. Very, very popular here in the States. Uh, another buffalo cheese that we have is the bush puff. So this is with Outback Bush Tomato. In Australia we have these tiny little tomatoes that grow out in the wild. And I have um, uh, them hand foraged and harvested. They're then roasted and smoked and we put them onto the outside of the cheese. It is a super smoky flavour. The base cheese is a buffalo uh, lactic fermentation cheese. So that's another one that's really quite popular here in the States. Um, We've also got Flinders. Flinders is um, again a buffalo cheese. We have a salt bush covering on this one and calistamine petals. Calistamine in, uh, is commonly known as bottle brush in Australia. Again, it's a really popular, really, really popular cheese. And then if you want something a little bit stronger, we've got what we call vigneron. Okay, so vigneron is wrapped in vine leaves. It's a goat's cheese. Um, and it is, when it's super, super ripe, you know, it does this. Oh, I didn't know 
problems with a... How about that? It's so cool. So we've got a really lovely combination of cheeses here that are, yeah, a really true expression of Australian cheese. I want to be able to tell that story to the world. Coming up next, where to find the best Indian ingredients for your next recipe. We will also take a look at the top rated Indian restaurants in the area that won't hurt your wallet. Only here on We Cook TV Network. All food news, all the time. Now back to you, Melinda. Eosinophils are a very important part uh, of our immune system and the interesting thing is uh, they were kind of originally used to help uh, fight off parasites. So in develop developing countries, um, you know, third world countries where there's not good sanitation or there's a lot of parasites, that's what your eosinophils are used for. So there's not actually a lot of environmental and food allergies, uh, whereas in more developed countries, such as Western countries like the United States, we don't have a lot of parasites. So your eosinophils need something to do, and they they decided basically that they're going to go ahead and uh, sometimes overreact to uh, to environment to the environment and to food. Uh, so there's actually a study done in 2018, which showed that. Uh, in uh, developing countries such as the United States, uh, well, food allergies have been reported to be as high as 10% uh, with the greatest prevalence in, in younger children. And there's actually increased prevalence um, in China and Africa. Uh, those food allergies are actually growing as, as they become, those, those regions of the world become more developed. Uh, and actually, when children from those regions come to the United States, they're actually having increased uh, food allergies. So, you know, is this something that with the genetically modified foods that, that we've, you know, it's not quite as natural as they were generations ago, that it's uh, people are becoming allergic the FDA actually breaks down food allergies into, there's eight, eight that are uh, identified by the FDA. Milk, eggs, fish, crustaceans like crabs, lobster, shrimp, uh, tree nuts such as peanuts, wheat, and soybeans. So those are the eight classes that are identified by the FDA. So there are, I don't know, I'm not sure if any of you have ever heard of a certain bacterial infection called Clostridium, Clostridium difficile or C. diff. It's a very, uh, very infectious form of diarrhea and uh, that can be caused by antibiotics. So that means that certain medications can kill off the good bacteria in, in your intestines. I tell my patients that, and I prescribe certain antibiotics, I tell them that they should take probiotic, uh, over-the-counter probiotics, you know, like you can just go to a health food store or go to the pharmacist and just tell them, you know, that they need some probiotics because they're taking antibiotics. So you want to replace the good bacteria uh, that, that the bad bacteria is killing off. There's actually uh, a theory and an ongoing study that should probably take about five years for completion that's being taking place in Boston uh, that they started with mice and mice with peanut allergies uh, were given the intestinal bacteria of mice that did not have allergies and the mice that were allergic uh, were cured essentially from the peanut allergies. So there's a, there's a thought that actually a very good theory that you know a lot of allergies are caused by the bacteria in our intestines so 
uh, they're working on possible human trials at uh, Children's Hospital in Boston for you know replacing uh, intestinal bacteria with children who have allergies such as peanuts uh, with the bacteria from children who are unallergic or who are not allergic. So it sounds promising, you know. A lot of times theories and studies work out well in animals that don't, but don't work out well in humans. But this is promising, and it could be, uh, it could be a massive breakthrough because uh, allergies can be not only annoying and you know a bit debilitating, but they can be they can be life threatening. So, with that said, uh, back to you with Barbara. Hi, today. Tom Beyer and I are at this fancy food show at Javits in New York, and we're visiting the booth of one of our absolutely very favorite cheese companies, Crave Brothers Cheese. We use Crave Brothers Cheese on our show, stress-free cooking, all the time, and we love it, don't we? It is absolutely one of the best tasting cheeses but I also love the story because it's a family-run business and the cheese is truly farm to table and at stress-free cooking we like everything to be fresh and the quality of our ingredients is super important to us so I want you to hear from the Crave family exactly what this is all about. Right hello I'm George Crave from Crave Brothers I'm one of the four Crave Brothers that operates Crave Brothers Farm and Farmstead Cheese in Waterloo Wisconsin where we talk about crops to cows, cheese to the consumer, and it means from the corn, the alfalfa, feeding the cows, the cow's milk, and its pipeline to the cheese factory, where we make our fresh mozzarella, our mascarpone, our mozzarella uh, balls, backpack balls, and then our uh, Wisconsin favorite, uh, fresh cheese curds. Uh, we have an assortment of fresh mozzarellas from our little curlinis, our backpack, logs and balls, to our marinated fresh mozzarella is very popular also. And we also make the great fresh sweet cream mascarpone. I love that mascarpone. Don't you love it? I, I do, and we have many wonderful recipe ideas. You You've brought us some. We love that. Thank you for that. And our own website, we have lots of fun ideas from soups and pizzas to your classic desserts with mascarpone. And yes. I know a lot of people love dessert, so it's a great place to go. Cravecheese.com. That is great. Shall we taste? I hope you do. Start with some marinated fresh mozzarella. It's our own okay. special blend of olive oil, canola oil, spices. It's an appetizer in a cup. Oh, great. And I think Tom probably would love to try that. I'm yes. the expert. He's the okay. expert on marinated okay. mozzarella. How is it? Delicious. Delicious? Oh. Yeah, it's so easy. You have the container here, the, the blends of herbs and spices. And I say, you know, it should be co-marketed next to toothpicks because you open it up <laughs> and you have toothpicks and you have an appetizer. It's just that easy. Or grape tomatoes. Right. That exactly. works really well, too. Yes. And this is a really nice way to serve this. It's something small. I like that. You know, one bite or two bites is great because people don't end up with it on their blouse. And that's called perlini, pearl-sized fresh mozzarella. And it's wonderful for salads and pastas and sprinkle in soups. Or you can skewer them. Yeah. I always say it's the size of a pearl a woman would want. Absolutely. And we actually used this on our breakfast souffle on the show one day and it made it melted beautifully. It was really wonderful. So I, I think we need to try this mascarpone. Now we did a pasta with wild mushrooms and mascarpone on the show. And that was really great. We have a favorite chocolate mascarpone pie also. It's just chocolate mascarpone in Kahlua or bourbon in an Oreo cookie crust. Wonderful. That sounds great. It is. It makes great sauces, desserts. You mix a little bit of lemon curd, lemoncello maybe, and then you fill some cannolis or make some cookies and uh, really makes different sauces. You know, it's way beyond tiramisu is what we like to say it. Uh, and they're, and it just use your creativity and think of different ways to use it. It's You're really just giving me a great idea. I have a recipe in one of my books for a nut crusted fruit tart and I normally use white cream cheese but I am going to make that fruit tart using that marshmallow. And, and then you're going to send us the recipe. Absolutely. <laughs> can't wait. And I think I'm going to put some lemon cello in there too. <laughs> so. Good. And 
before we leave, Debbie, I would just love it if you would tell us where we can find your cheese. Okay, our wonderful cheeses are sold at Whole Food stores across the country and online at CraveCheese.com. Thank you so much, and I hope that everyone gets to enjoy your cheeses as much as Tom and I do. Thank you. You're welcome. Want to go vegan? On the next We Cook TV episode, it's a piece of cake. Vegan cake, that is. So keep your end goals in mind, but go at your own pace. Some people manage to go vegan overnight, and that's fantastic. But if that's not right for you, don't be concerned. See, any lifestyle change, like going vegan, takes a lot of time, and then you're going to need to determine what's right for you. Like anything, it's not a one-size-fits-all, and there's numerous approaches. Back to you in the studio. We're back to We Cook TV News. I'm Jason, here to talk to you about food poisoning. So food poisoning, a lot of symptoms of, uh, most common symptoms of food poisoning are nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain and cramps. Uh, you can sometimes get fever or and you can get diarrhea as well as uh, that can be watery or bloody and that can be caused by uh, you know many different many different things um, food poison there's so many different types of food poisoning be that bacterial or viral uh, so it can be caused by the in an infected person who's handling uh, is handling the food uh, if they don't clean their hands properly, then they can spread uh, the bacteria or the virus to your food and in, in turn to you. Um, and you can get those from, uh, from various different types of foods. It can be meat, poultry, dairy products, uh, shellfish, lunch meat, you know, all different types of things. Uh, different bacteria and different viruses like to be caused, you know, like to live in certain environments. So there's many different ones. Uh, we'll talk about some of those today. Um, and your symptoms can, depending on which what you're infected with, uh, they can they can arise within hours or weeks later. Uh, so some of the most common ones. Uh, Staph aureus, you always, I'm sure most of you heard of staph infections. So that is something that you can get, uh, you can get that in your food as well, and that can cause a lot of problems. Uh, you can get it from meats, salads, uh, creamy filled pastries, and it can be spread by uh, coughing, sneezing, hand to hand contact. So rotavirus, um, happens in one to three days and that's caused by usually caused by um, raw raw foods ready to eat produce you got to make sure you're if you're getting your produce uh, from the store you want to make sure that you clean it really well uh, you don't just you know grab an apple and eat it right away you gotta make sure that you're uh, washing off as much of the pesticides and then uh, any sort of bacteria or viruses that could be on there um, Norwalk is something else. Now, Norwalk is caused by you know, similar type of situation as rotavirus, but it also can be caused by shellfish and contaminated water. You hear that you hear about those a lot on cruise ships. You know, anytime where people are in a close proximity to each other, um, once one person gets it, you know, a lot of people can get it. So, if you're on a cruise ship and you have symptoms of norovirus, you're gonna be quarantined for the rest of your vacation just to try to, uh, try to prevent uh, the virus from spreading to others. Hepatitis A is very important. That's the one that a lot of times takes the longest to show up. Um, with that, you know, it can be caused by, you know, shellfish from contaminated water, raw, a bunch of raw foods. But usually it's caused by you know, a person who has 
this this virus, and you know they're not properly cleaning the food or um, cleaning their hands, and they can spread that to your food, um, and you can get you know that can, that can cause liver failure. You can have elevated liver en enzymes, cramps, nausea, you can get jaundice, meaning yellow color of the skin. Um, there actually is a vaccine for hepatitis A. Uh, so, if you're tr especially if you're traveling internationally uh, to various regions, uh, more second and third world countries, you know, developing countries, not ones that are, uh, you're less likely to get hepatitis A in countries, you know, such as the you know, United States and Canada, Great Britain, but you still can, you know. Um, but the vaccine is a two-part series, which is you know you get the first shot and then six months later you go back and you get the other shot um, so you want to plan ahead if you have an international trip coming up um, E. coli is something that's you know, usually caused by beef um, contaminated beef uh, which usually happens during the slaughter process I don't want to go into the details of that with you right now but um, if the beef gets contaminated during the slaughtering process Botulism, actually, you've probably heard of botulism. That's that is you know pretty rare, but it, it can still happen by a lot of like uh, canned goods at home, like home canned goods, not necessarily ones from the store. But if you are canning at home, if you that's not done properly, then you can get botulism, especially um, things like yeah, you can also get it from like honey. So if your canned goods aren't properly taken care of or you can get it from, uh, you know, from fresh honey and that can cause paralysis uh, so it's, it, can be, it can be very dangerous and another one I want to talk to you about is uh, listeria so listeria um, it's caused by uh, a lot of times hot dogs undercooked you know lunch meat unpasteurized milk and dairy products uh, so, you know, they, a lot of these cause the same type of symptoms as other ones. A few of them can result in, you know, bloody diarrhea, can cause uh, kidney failure. Uh, but listeria itself uh, is extremely dangerous to pregnant women. So, you know, while the, the mother may have just very mild symptoms, you know, she can pass it on to the, to the baby, you know, while the baby's a fetus in, uh, in the womb uh, and the baby can have long-term neurologic outcomes, you know, bad outcomes. Um, so it's very important for a you know, pregnant woman to watch her diet uh, and try to avoid those types of foods. You know, just good prevention, you know, wash your hands, wash your, wash your utensils and food services often. Uh, Wash them with warm, soapy water before you know before you handle the food and and after. Um, you want to use hot, soapy water for utensils and cutting boards for sure. Um, use use warm for your hands, but hot for all of your utensils. You want to keep your raw foods like your your chicken breast and your ground beef away from your vegetables, um, so you don't want to pass. You know, salmonella from chicken into your salad. You know, if, it, if it's in your chicken, there's a pretty good chance you could cook it hot enough to kill the bacteria. But if you're not, you're not gonna obviously cook your salad. So you get some of that chicken juice onto your salad, you're gonna be in trouble. Uh, you want to cook foods at a safe temperature. You want to defrost food safely. Don't just lay it on the counter and let it defrost at room temperature. The best way to do it is to have it happen in the refrigerator or you could microwave it using the defrost button. It's better to do that in more of a controlled manner than just you know leaving it out in your 70 degree home all day and just letting the bacteria just have a field day with your hamburger that you're gonna make for the night. Um, and if you have any questions if you're not sure if something's gonna be safe just throw it away. That's the best way you know it's, it's so much easier like most things uh, in the healthcare field, it's way better to prevent an illness than to try to treat an illness once it's 
once it's taken hold. So you want to make sure you're properly taking care of your food, uh, preparing it well. Uh, if, if you happen to get ill, uh, you want to stay as hydrated as possible. You want to, uh, you probably actually want to avoid things like, you know, anti-diarrheal medication over the counter because you would actually want the illness to get flushed out as much as possible. If you, if you slow things down in that type of occasion, then, then um, it, can cause, it can cause issues, you know, with your intestines and, and uh, can lead to, it can, it can lead to further, further bad outcomes. So you want to just stay hydrated, you know, let, let everything just kind of pass through you, but try to stay up with your hydration. And if you get a fever, basically a temperature greater, an oral temperature greater than a 100.4, or if you get bloody diarrhea, or if you, or if you just can't keep up with the fluids, um, for any other concern, then you would want to see your family doctor, or uh, you know, go to the nearest urgent care, or even even the emergency department if if you uh, feel that. That you're ill enough to seek that type of uh, to seek that type of treatment. All right, and we'll throw it back to Candyman. Where the warm and dark place to the upper side of the body. Second, uh, like this. And now look, I have the sugar laying over here, and I stretch it long. And when I stretch it long, I just keep it to roll like this. Yeah, making like this. Cutting over here, taking a stick and the lollipop thread. Like this we're working. Like this we have a lot of different forms how to make lollipops. For example, this one is uh, also very nice. Making like this, cutting over here, putting the stick in there and then I need to work it too, for example. And I'm working on and abracadabra, I have a flower, yeah? This, I'm boring, or oh, you're just tired. That's the thing. <laughs> okay, my flower lollipop. So, Mr. Tarek, for you, I will make a lollipop as well. It's my special form. Tarek was playing for me, Captain Hook. Captain Hook is a pirate, right? What the pirate got in his flag? A skull, right, so we'll see. Making like this. Putting the stick in there. So, taking this out like this. This is your lollipop, eh? This is the coolest lollipop what I have, ladies and gentlemen. So, but now, what we can make also, I want to let you try of this delicious sugar, what I have over here. You want to try? Yes? No, you not. You're sweet enough. I let you try all. Oh, where are you from? You believe in magic? Yeah, I will make you a magic lollipop. Don't run away. Just even, for all those who would like to try, just even open your hand. You as well, come here. Like this, my hand is my lollipops are facing. So if you would like to take a lollipop with home, don't run away. Just even wait till I'm ready with my show. Right now, I just even would like to let you try. The sugar is still warm. Open your hand. And now, I will ask you one question. Do you like my candies? Delicious. It's very nice. Okay. Here, also for you. What about you? No. And now coming back for the magic lollipop. Ladies, you can come a little bit closer, please. For a magic lollipop, I need a magic stick. Okay? So, making like this, twisting like this, rolling up like this, taking a magic stick, put the magic stick in here, then I'm forming this form, yeah? Making like this. Oh, but you know why this heart is a magic heart? 
you have to look straight away for the heart. And I will look over the heart straight away at your beautiful eyes, okay? Then we'll see if this is working out. You're ready for this? Three, two, one. Don't forget. Don't forget. Don't forget. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining my show. I hope you enjoyed it a little bit. Thank you so much.